Thelma Fable is the great aunt that raised Tina Fontaine. Moments before the verdict, she walked into court with family, already visibly distraught. Moments later, neither she nor her family members were talking. Friends and supporters like activist Sue Caribou did that for them. Not once in my life have I ever seen justice since I was fucking young. Not once do our people ever get justice. I have 10 murder, two missing, and to this fucking day we don't have justice. Tina Fontaine was 15 when she went missing in Winnipeg in August 2014. Her body later found in the Red River, wrapped up in a duvet cover. Society, we'd be horrified if somebody put, uh, if we found uh, a litter of kittens or pups in the river in this condition. She quickly became a national symbol. Her death added urgency to calls for an inquiry into missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. Fontaine was also in foster care and ran away from a supervised placement in a hotel, a practice Manitoba has since banned. All as calls rang loudly for justice particularly from the Indigenous community. Early on, Raymond Cormier was questioned in Fontaine's death. Don't focus on me, because the guy did this, because I didn't do it, right? Okay. After a covert police investigation, he was charged with second-degree murder more than a year later. At trial, the Crown alleged he killed Fontaine because he had sex with her and feared he'd be branded a pedophile. At one point, she did report him to police for stealing. I like to report a blue truck that was stolen earlier today. Months later, police secretly recorded Cormier talking about Fontaine's death. His defense argued those comments were out of context. It also called witnesses who said Cormier owned a duvet cover identical to the one Fontaine's body was found in unreliable. Meanwhile, that duvet cover, the stolen truck, and Fontaine's body all lacked forensic evidence to link her death to Cormier. A pathologist could not determine a cause of death or say definitively if she was murdered. In the end, the jury was not convinced Cormier was responsible. Indigenous leaders are questioning the investigation. There's not much I can say. I mean, an injustice done to our people again today. I just hope that people that are watching worldwide see what we have to deal with every day. And we have Cam McIntosh joining us right now. And, and Cam, that was the reaction outside the court. What about inside? Well, Andrew, as it got underway, a lot of tension, a lot of nervous energy. To put it in context, you know, for the last three and a half years, this has been a very high-profile case here in Winnipeg and across Manitoba and across the country. Uh, a lot of people had their minds made up when Raymond Cormier was arrested and charged more than a year after Tina Fontaine's death. And frankly, the shadow of the Stanley verdict in Saskatchewan set a tone coming into this trial. So when things got going, we went into the courtroom around the same time Thelma Fable did. She took her seat with her family, her friends, her supporters. Uh, the media was sitting on the other side of the gallery. Raymond Cormier was brought in. He took a simple glance. He went and sat in the prisoner's box. The uh, judge made a statement uh, before Cormier came in. At acknowledging the emotional nature of all this. He asked anyone that couldn't keep their emotions in check to leave. No one did. The jury then came in. They looked very somber. They weren't making eye contact with anyone. Juries rarely do. When the verdict was read out, it was very quiet. It was hard to hear it at first. And then there was an audible gasp through the room. Uh, it sounded like disbelief, sorrow, disgust from many people. Now keep in mind that uh, this trial started off with the presumption that um, Raymond Cormier was innocent. It concluded with that verdict still for the family. Uh, a lot of pain. Uh, Tina Fontaine's mother left the court, stormed out, yelled F you a Cormier. Thelma Fable, who was sitting just a few meters behind him, uh, said I hope we're happy in hell you effer. Outside here on the court steps though, Indigenous leaders were raising the question, if not Raymond Cormier, then who is responsible? It might not be this accused person that took her life, but someone took her life. That fact remains, and we must get to the bottom of it. Now, the Winnipeg Police Service has issued a statement tonight. It's a very uh, brief statement saying it empathizes with the family of Tina Fontaine, but it did do a thorough investigation. It says it will not comment further pending the possibility of an appeal. There's 30 days in which the Crown can uh, post an appeal in this case. As for further reaction, out here on the court, court steps, it was very measured. There were fears that there would be a large gathering here tonight and potentially a, uh, a very angry gathering that didn't materialize. However, there will be a rally here in Winnipeg tomorrow 
starting at 10.30 local time where I'm standing at the courthouse that's going to march down to the forks here in Winnipeg. Okay, we'll be watching. Cam McIntosh in Winnipeg. Thanks. Now, as Cameron said, the case of Tina Fontaine touched a nerve across the country, escalating calls for an inquiry into murdered and missing Indigenous women and girls. For a lot of people to see and understand and to hear what's going on would, uh, I think, help uh, lead to solutions and, and bring, you know, the right people together to create the solutions that we need. Her case prompted other families to tell their own stories of loss and to join the appeal for a serious government response. The inquiry was launched in late 2015. And today, as the jury deliberated, inquiry leaders said, since her death woke the country in August 2014, Tina's family, friends, and community have shown great strength through the police investigation, court process, and trial. May our warmth and love wrap around each of them. Tonight, the Minister of Crown Indigenous Relations, Carolyn Bennett, said Tina Fontaine's case underscores the need for the inquiry to complete its mandate. We need to examine all the factors that lead to these violent acts, including policing, child welfare, health care, and the social and economic conditions, the minister said in a statement. As a society, we can and must do better to improve outcomes for Indigenous girls and women. Now, today, the latest set of hearings in the National Inquiry wrapped up in the Nunavut community of Rankin Inlet, and it ended with some powerful testimony from a well-known voice. Inuk singer Susan Aglu-Kark shared her personal story about the lasting impacts of childhood sexual abuse by someone who she says was a friend of the family. I don't cry for myself. I cry because... I found out on Tuesday that he's been charged again. After 25 years here in this community, how many more victims? Nothing's changed. And my guilt is I did what I could. I did what I could. 25 years ago. And he's been charged again. It is not just a violation of the body. It's an ongoing violation forever of the mind and the heart and your life. And Rosie, difficult to listen to there, but uh, Aglukark ended her testimony with some recommendations, including healing centers for victims and changes in how investigations are conducted.